Good morning, good day, good evening, good overnight, whenever you happen to be listening to this. Welcome once again to Just Thoughts. The Rapture Error Part 2. As you recall in the last Bible study, we had covered the pertinent chapters from the book of Revelation and also Isaiah 14, which we had just finished up with, identifying who is being talked about. In other words, Satan the opponent, the adversary, and that he is indeed the Antichrist, and we're going to continue with that. We're going to pick this up in Ezekiel chapter 28 to go along with what we've already studied to see what the subject and the object of this is. In other words, that Satan fell in the first earth age and that in this earth age he shall be cast down where he will have five months to play the role of Christ which is called the Antichrist. In other words, in place of Christ or instead of Christ or even in the stead of Christ. But we're going to be going to Ezekiel chapter 28 to begin this. Again, the whole purpose is to know your enemy. And we're, it's going to be made clear as to who we're talking about, just as it was in the last uh, Bible study, with Isaiah 14 even naming him as Lucifer. At any rate, before we begin this Bible study, let us do as you should always do when you're going to study our Father's Word. Let us go before our Father together in prayer and let us ask for wisdom and understanding as we undertake the study of this his most holy word so let us pray and let us pray together our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy glorious name O heavenly father we thank you O heavenly father for your word for revealing these truths to us father we ask that you open eyes and ears and hearts and minds to be able to receive these truths, Father. We ask that you edify the body of Christ, that we may know and understand the things which are soon upon us. We ask for you to always light the way, Father, and clear the path for us that we may understand and know for a surety everything that is written within your word is the truth and is unbreakable. And we ask these things, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Amen, and Amen. So we're going to pick this up here, Ezekiel chapter 28, and verse 1. This will be God speaking to Ezekiel. And verse 1, and it reads, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, verse 2, Son of man, in other words, son of the flesh man, which is what Ezekiel was, say unto the prince of Tyrus, and this would be more properly translated, Prince Tyrus, because there is no of really in the article if you go and look it up in the Hebrew, but we'll let it stand. Say to the prince of Tyrus, in other words, this is a lowered state. This is not the king, which will be addressed later, but this is in his lowly state. This is after he has fallen. So, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, that is to say, in pride, and thou hast said, I am God. Now you'll notice there's uppercase G there. He claims to be God. He claims to be the Father. He claims to be Christ. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, of course, naturally, if you understand the book of Revelation, the sea are the seas of people. But if you want to look at it purely from the geographical, I sit amongst the midst of the seas. In other words, he occupies the land of Jerusalem when he comes back as Antichrist. 
and it is in the midst of the seas of the earth as every continent is to continue the verse yet thou art a man okay this is another thing that people need to learn is this means male of gender I know it says man and it has to do also with the terminology in 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 which we will be coming to where he is the man of sin the son of perdition and in this we're going to learn how he becomes the son of perdition so again yet thou art a man and not God though thou set thine heart as the heart of God in other words though you want to be God though you think in your heart and mind that you can become God verse 3 Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret they can hide from thee. This, this ought to be a warning to you. Daniel was a very wise man, able to discern, discern dreams, and became a very valued uh, interpreter and leader in Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar because he had the power of God in him. In other words, he had the Holy Spirit, and he was able to speak with it. But this one, the king of Tyrus, naturally we're talking about, Tyrus means the rock. It is sore in the Hebrew. The king of the rock, in other words, the false rock. He's told here, behold, you're wiser than Daniel. There's no secret they can hide from thee. In other words, Satan would rip most people apart uh, on the level of understanding and the level of sheer intelligence that he has. Verse 4. With thy wisdom and thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches. Thou hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. Funny, the gold and silver motif keeps popping up. We covered that a few lectures back, where the golden head represents the Kenites, the silver represents the politicians, and not only that, in this case, you could say it was literal wealth. You know, maybe not gold and silver, but gold and silver is a metaphor that we can understand because it is precious metals, and it is what is very uh, prevalent here upon the earth as far as what the wealthy own. In other words, Satan has become very rich. Verse 5, By thy great wisdom... And thy traffic, which is to say his speech and, and the people that follow them. Thou hast increased thy riches. And thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. In other words, because you have gained so much and so many to follow you, your heart has been lifted up to where you think you can be like God. Verse 6. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, Verse 7, Behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of nations, and they shall draw thy swords against thy, the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. Now, naturally, terrible here is a strong word. It doesn't mean terrible in the bad. It just means uh, a very powerful force. We are talking about the election here, the ships of Chittim, the cedars of Lebanon. Behold, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of nations, and they shall draw their swords against thee. And naturally, what is it the, the, the elect uses swords? Well, it's Revelation 1.16. It's the two-edged tongue of Christ. It's the word of God and the Holy Spirit, the Ruach. So they're going to draw their swords. They're going to draw the Holy Spirit against the beauty of his wisdom. And they shall defile thy brightness. In other words, they're, they're going to bring him down a few notches. Again, the uh, prince of Tyrus, the king of Tyrus, in um, a historical sense, was a real person. But we're not talking about that particular man. He is only a type and example so that we can understand who is really being talked about here. Verse 8. They shall bring thee down to the side to, to the pit. And thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. In other words, Satan is going to die just like everyone else upon the earth, the sea, the sea is the people that are cast into hell. In other words, 
even though he was a beloved archangel, even though he had wisdom and wealth, he's going to die the death of them that are mere human beings. In other words, he's got a mortal soul. Verse 9. Will thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. And naturally we know that God is the one who's going to kill him. Now the elect shall slay him, and that means spiritually. They're going to defile his wisdom. They can't kill him, but God can. And we will see that as this goes on. Verse 10. And thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hands of strangers. You know, an uncircumcised person at this time was a Gentile. And what it meant here was one who is not learned in the ways of God. But Satan is learned in the ways of God, yet he is spoken of as uncircumcised. Why? Because he is against God. He is ignorant to try to take on God. Therefore, he, the word uncircumcised is used. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hands of strangers. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Again, this would also apply to the king of Tyrus that was a historical figure. But I'm teaching from the prophetical, as I so often do. Because in these things, all these things were done for examples and types so that we may understand. And a lot of metaphors are used. And a lot of examples. Verse 11. Moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation. That is a sad funeral song. Upon the king of Tyrus. In other words, now he's not the prince. Now he's the king. This is in reverse order because Satan was the king of Tyrus. And he fell. In other words, he was once loved by God, beloved. He was a cherubim that God loved dearly. Yet he rebelled against God, as we've been reading and as we re had studied in the last lecture. So, again, verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation song, a sad funeral song, for the king of Tyrus. In other words, God laments that, that Satan turned evil. And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum. In other words, you were made the full pattern, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, and naturally Satan has been in Eden. That's where he um, deceived Adam and Eve. That's where he was, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where also Christ was, the tree of life. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. In other words, God made him beautiful. God gave him wealth and riches, and no doubt even musical ability. Now, in case you're wondering who exactly we're talking about, if you actually think we're talking about a flesh man, King of Tyrus, verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. That was Satan's job. That's what he did. And I have said thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And that's holy fire. Verse 15. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created. Till, that is to say, until iniquity was found in thee. In other words, until Satan fell in sin. Verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise... They have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. In other words, God is the one who is judge over all. Now, by the multitude of Satan's merchandise, they have 
filled the midst of thee with violence. In other words, those who followed Satan brought him into war with God. In other words, he got the big head and thought he could stand against God. And he sinned. Therefore, God is going to cast him as profane. That is to say, sinful and putrid out of the mountain of God. And God says, I will destroy the old covering cherubim from the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, and thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. And I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And you better believe that Satan's going to be cast to the ground. We covered that in Revelation chapter 9. I saw a star fall from heaven, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the pit and released his locust army. In other words, God is going to send him down to earth and lay him before the kings of the world. Verse 18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic, again his speech and, and those that listen to his speech, Therefore I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. In other words, this is Satan's death sentence. It is where he will be destroyed, cast into hell fire, and burned up. And he will be turned to ashes, as all souls do when they enter the lake of fire. I know many people teach that when you go to hell you burn forever and ever and ever in agony. But that's not true. Christ told us, Fear not them that can kill your flesh body. Rather feel, fear him that can kill both body and soul in hell. And the word is apoptino, which means to destroy utterly and outright. To kill. To cause the death of. And all this is going to be done in the sight of everyone. All them that behold thee. Verse 19. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shall thou be any more. In other words, everyone knows Satan, whether they follow him, whether they are indifferent, or whether they're his enemy. Everyone knows him. They're all going to be astonished at his end, because he was God's favorite. And it's going to be a terror. It's going to be a horrible thing to witness. You know, even the execution of a prisoner is something that is a horrible thing to witness. It's a horrible thing to witness the life of a living, healthy being being snuffed out because they sinned. Or just, it's a horrible thing to watch anyone die, period. But then what does it say? Never shall thou be any more. In other words, Satan isn't going to rule over hell. He, it isn't going to be a big party down below the earth somewhere or in some dimension. He's not going to be anymore. He's going to be wiped out. In other words, he's going to be blotted out. He's going to be finished. He's going to be done. He's not going to exist anymore whatsoever. And he's never going to be spoken of or heard from again. There will never be the, an occasion to mention the name of Satan or the name of Lucifer ever again. And imagine that. One of God's favorites being destroyed. That's how much your father loves you. Your father loves you so very much till he will destroy one of his favorites and all of his children that stand against him so that you can have peace throughout all the eternity and never have to deal with another rebellion or another uprising or another riot, or another mob, such as we see daily here upon this earth. Never another war. But let us go now. I, I'm finished. I'm going to finish up there for this chapter. Let us go now and hear what Christ said. Christ is going to be questioned directly about the events that consummate the end of this earth age. We're going to be going to Matthew chapter 24. It's also written in Mark 13 and Luke 21. But I choose to use Matthew 24 because it brings forth a lot more clarity. So, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. 
And his disciples came to him for him to show him the buildings of the temple. Verse 2. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? In other words, do you see this wonderful temple and this wonderful wall and this wonderful city of Jerusalem? Verily I say unto you, in other words, truly I say unto you, there shall not be one, uh, there shall not be left here one stone upon another. In other words, that's, that's not even one stone left atop another. This shall not be thrown down. And when does that happen? Did it happen with the destruction of Solomon's temple? Did it happen with the destruction of the second temple? No, it did not. The Western Wailing Wall still exists to this very day. Christ said there would not be one stone that shall not be thrown down. Therefore, we know it is yet future to us. Jerusalem shall be flattened and shall be a desolation. Verse 3. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives... The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these th things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world? Question. Okay, that right there is your qualifier for everything that's going to be discussed for the rest of this chapter. Tell us, when shall these things be? One. Ver uh, two. Two. What shall be the sign of thy coming? In other words, you're coming back to the earth. And three, the end of the world. Okay, so how much clearer do you need it put for you than that? The end of the world. The end of this cosmos. The end of this earth age. Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. And that would include the man that we've been discussing. That is to say, that man of sin, the son of perdition, Satan, or any man. I don't care if it's a super preacher or someone you trust or a family member. It doesn't matter. Let no man deceive you. Verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. In other words, they will admit that Christ is the Lord and Savior. And shall deceive many. I mean, there's many super preachers doing that right now, calling upon the name of Christ and filling their uh, coffers and buckets full of money and living in their palatial estates. And then there's others who aren't so rich but still deceive people with vain words that tickle the ears of those who listen, but they are traditions of men that make void the word of God. Verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. And that's still going on to this day. I mean, look at what's going on over in Jerusalem, even though there's a ceasefire currently. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. You know, Amos chapter 8. What is the famine for the end times? For the word of God. And pestilences. In other words, God is going to send pestilences. There's a lot of pestilences on the earth uh, in everyday life. And a, a lot of bad things that happen upon the earth. Tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, and, and, and the like. But God's going to send some too. And earthquakes in diverse places. And again, we see that happening all over the place now. We, I mean, we know by this that the birth pains are getting closer and closer every day. You know, the, the, the time is not that far away. Probably sooner than many would think. Verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. In other words, it's not the end yet. This is the beginning of sorrows when you see this stuff. Verse 9. Then, in other words, in a separate time, we're not talking about during the beginning of sorrows, they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, naturally, this has been going on all through the history of Christianity and Christendom, but specifically, we're looking forward to when the elect are delivered up before Sanhedrin's kings and councils, and eventually before Satan himself. For a testimony. 
And you can better believe that we're going to be hated of all nations for Christ's namesake. That is to say, the true Christ. Why? Because we're not worshipping what they believe is Christ. We're not worshipping old instead of Christ. Verse 10. And then many shall be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. In other words, there's going to be splits, divisions. Households are going to uh, be set apart by this. You know, Christ said in, in another, in another uh, chapter, another gospel, Think not that I am come to bring priests upon the earth. I am come to bring a sword. To separate households. To separate the father from the son and the mother from the daughter and the mother-in-law from the daughter-in-law and so on and so forth. And that is exactly what happens even today. When you try to tell someone the truth about the rapture or about the Kenites, the seed serpent, uh, the serpent seed that is, or many other things, the, the, the true sin in the garden and what came of it, which again would be that serpent seed line. People will act like you're stupid. People will act like you're superstitious. People will act like you have no knowledge of what you're talking about. Many of them simply going to church and listening to what their good pastor had to say. Yes, the Lord is one God, and we should all love our neighbor, and we should all be good people, and we should care for the children, and we should be charitable. And we will now sing a hymn, and then you can all go home and watch football and have Sunday dinner. And that's what you get at most churches. But people are literally going to hate one another. And many do now. I mean, I, <laughs> I get quite a good, good deal of hate mail. Uh, I shouldn't say mail, hate comments and hate messages. But hey... You, know, you expect this when you're teaching our Father's Word. Does it mean I'm absolutely right? Does it mean I'm absolutely wrong? That's why you have to study for yourself to show yourself approved. Verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And boy, we see that going on right now. I mean, naturally, there's going to be, when Satan's locust army, there's going to be real false prophets here. But there's plenty of false prophets now that are claiming that they have seen, they have seen. God gave me a word the other day when I was sitting in the car wash. The other night I was in prayer meditating and the Lord came to me and showed me this. And he told me to tell you. God came down and showed me exactly when the rapture is going to happen. You know, <laughs> All you got to do is to spend a little time on YouTube and you'll, you'll see all of this and far worse, believe me. Verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, that is to say sin and false doctrine, the love of many shall wax cold. In other words, what other kind of iniquity are we talking about here? Well, the natural love between man and woman, the natural love of family, all the things that the Kenites have uh, set out to destroy, brotherly love, and because of this, the love of many shall wax cold. That's like a cold candle, you know. In other words, instead of being warm and vibrant, it's cold and insensitive. Verse 13. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, did that say that he that shall endure to the flying away, to the rapture, shall be saved? No, that's not what it said. It said to the end. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. That is to say, all peoples. And then the end shall come. Verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay, we're going to stop there and we're going to go back over this for a minute. When you see the abomination, okay, what, what is an abomination? That's something that is against God. Of desolation. Now many people read this word desolation and think it means the state of desolation. It does not. If you go back and properly translate this, it is when you shall see the abomination of the desolator. 
which is another name for Satan. He is the, pon the opponent, the destroyer, the desolator. In other words, when you see his abomination, well, you would have to be here to see that. Spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and we will be covering that later. I'm not going to go there now because it would take up too much time, and I don't want to lose the thought that Christ is giving in this chapter. But we will be covering Daniel chapter 8 and 9, at least the pertinent verses. But when you see the abomination of desolation, that is to say the desolator, stand in the holy place. What is the holy place? That's God's place. That's Christ's place. That's why he's called instead of Christ. That's why it says, whoso readeth, let him understand. In other words, if you study our Father's word, you will understand. When you see him stand in God's place claiming to be God, as we read earlier, or claiming to be Christ, or claiming to be David, the Messiah promised, or claiming to be Muhammad, or whatever he chooses to call himself, he'll probably say he's some of all of them in reality. I mean, the whole world's going to fall and worship him then understand. Verse 16. Let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Why? There's going to be a flood there. Not a literal flood of water, but a flood of lies. In other words, you don't want to be in the midst of that. You don't want to be in the midst of that until you are delivered up to it and you're there for God to deliver a testimony for Him via the Holy Spirit which shall speak through you. In other words, it's letting you know that Judea is the focal point, again. Verse 17. Let him which is on the housetop, that means the watchman, not come down to take anything out of his house. Verse 18. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. In other words, don't go there. Get out of Judea. Verse 18. And woe unto, those, uh, unto them which are with child, and to those that give suck in those days. Now, why would Christ say this? Woe, warning to those that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. This means to have a suckling child at your breast. Okay, why, why would Christ say that? God told the uh, people of the world, go forward, be fruitful, and multiply. And that's never been rescinded. Uh, bringing forth children, rearing children, being a mother, being a father is an honorable thing. Bringing forth your, your progeny is an honorable thing. So why does Christ say this? Well, it means woe to those that are with child. In other words, that did not wait on their true husband. That have been impregnated by another. As Eve was impregnated by another. And to those that give suck in those days. In other words, the analogy is this. Christ has been gone for a long time, and when he returns, he's seeking a bride. And if he comes back and that bride is with child, or sitting there suckling a newborn babe, that means she hasn't been faithful. Isaiah 54 will uh, help you clear up some of this. And we'll, we'll cover Isaiah 54 in just a minute. That is to say, just a verse of it. Verse 20. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now, most people are going to see the word flight here, and that's all they're going to see in this sentence. They're going to say, there it is. There's the rapture. That's it. To take flight means to run away. Okay? Or to make your escape. Remember when Zedekiah tried to take flight? Pray that your escape be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Okay, why? Because in winter, it's after the harvest. It's too late then. And the Sabbath day is the day of rest. That's the day that Christ set forth for us. Christ became our Sabbath. In other words, you don't want to be deceived on that day. You, you don't want to think that you're going to fly away on that day. If, if flight has any article in the sentence, that would be a good analogy for it. Verse 21. In other words, you're to be knowledgeable ahead of time. Don't wait until the last minute. Verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, 
to this time no nor ever shall be. Verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days have been shortened. In other words, what did we read that those days were shortened to from the original seven years? To five months. Revelation chapter 9. Five months is how long Satan has power. Verse 23. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Why? Because it's not Christ. It's Antichrist. It is Satan playing the role of Christ. Verse 24. For there shall arise false Christs. Okay, I want to I make a correction here. This is written in the plural, fo plural form. There shall arise false Christs. Naturally, there have been many who have claimed to be Christ down through the ages. Some even now claiming that they're Christ in other parts of the world. So this is nothing new. But this word here, false Christ, is pseudo Christos. It is G5580 in the Greek partition of your Strong's Concordance from G5571 and G5547. It means a spurious Messiah, false Christ. In other words, for there shall arise the spurious Messiah. And false prophets, in other words, his locust army with him. And shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Now, we read that in Revelation chapter 13, that he has power to make lightning come down from the skies and to do miracles in the sight of the beast. That was in the last Bible study. Verse 25. Behold, I have told you before. In other words, I have told you ahead of time. Christ is saying here, before I have told you beforehand. Before this happens, I have told you. Verse 26. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. Okay? Now, secret chambers, that could be considered the holy of holies, or even the temple. And uh, believe it or not, the body of Christ is supposed to be the temple, and um, he will enter into the body of Christ. That is to say, they will be deceived by him on a spiritual uh, connotation basis. But you know, right now in Jerusalem, they are building a new temple at Jerusalem, which God did not sanction them to build. God didn't tell them to build that. And it would be a great place for a secret chamber. It would be a great place for a new holy of holies, only not so holy in this case, since it's being built and funded by the Kenites. Verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and even shineth unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, lightning strikes instantly. And that's why most people believe in the rapture. They think Christ is going to show up instantly without warning. But is Christ not warning us now? In other words, why would Christ show up as lightning if we're forewarned about the Antichrist coming? And if we understand the 5th, 6th, and 7th trump and their alignment and that Christ shows up at the 7th trump, Satan is cast out of heaven at the 5th and takes power as the 6th claiming to be Christ. Well, it means that people will be worshiping him and they're going to be caught off guard. Christ will show up in a moment, in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, like lightning. And they're not going to be looking for another Christ if they think Christ is already here. Only they're going to have been worshiping Satan, which is why they're going to mourn. Verse 28. For wheresoever the carcass is, and the carcass represents death, who is death? Who has the power of death? Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. Satan. There will the eagles be gathered. And this word eagles is, is mistranslated. It should be vultures. Eagles are birds of prey. Vultures are birds of opportunity. And they are opportunists. They're going to be gathered together. They're looking for the easy way out, friend. 
They're looking for the easy way out, the path of least resistance. And unwilling to study our Father's Word. Satan is death. He can cause the death of the soul. Now I want you to listen to what Jesus Christ, Yahshua, Christos, Hamashiach, Ben Yahweh, had to say here. He says, immediately, in verse 29, immediately after, repeat, after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. In other words, it's going to be the end of this earth age. Verse 30. And then... Now I want you to understand this. After the tribulation, okay? And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Again, why are they mourning? Because they've been fallen and worshipping the wrong one. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And the clouds here is clouds of witnesses and we'll be covering that don't worry we're going to get around to it we're going to explain this whole uh meet the lord in the air and then the clouds uh english only nonsense verse 31 and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet that's the seventh trumpet okay not the fifth trumpet not the sixth trumpet not before satan shows up after it's the last trump out and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds that's the four directions from one end of heaven to the other and where are they going to gather them to to Jerusalem to stand on Mount Zion with Christ that's written in Revelation chapter 14 we'll be covering that possibly in the next uh, Bible study or one of the next few verse 32 now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Now, in the other two Gospels, this is written as when her branch is yet tender or when its branch is yet tender. There's a reason for that. There's written three different ways here. And I'll explain that in a moment. But it puts forth leaves. In other words, there's no fruit. It doesn't bring forth any fruit. And when you see this happen, you know that summer is nigh, which is to say the harvest. Well, how can you have a harvest when there's no fruit? That lets you know it's only going to be a small number that make it. The rest of the world's going to be deceived. Now, let's go and look at this parable of the fig tree. First of all, it has to do with Jerusalem, and it has to do with Israel becoming a nation again. Written in Jeremiah chapter 24, the good and the bad fig planted together so that they become a nation when it doesn't look like it will. That's why the branch is yet tender, but it sprouts forth. But it puts forth leaves and no fruit. By that, you know that the end is near. That happened in the year of our Lord, 1948, that Israel became a nation. And in 1968, they had another war. Now, the reason that it's put forth as his seed, or excuse me, his branch, her branch, and its branch. Okay? First of all, its branch means that Israel will become a nation again. Her branch means the seed of Eve is going to bring forth. Okay? And the seed of Eve with Adam. That is to say, through the line of Seth, down through uh, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel down through the stem of Jesse, the seed of David, would come Christ. And would come the election. In other words, not necessarily through the same line as Christ, but of Israel. In other words, the good fig. And then you've got the seed of him, when his branch is yet tender. That's the Kenites. That's those who bring this into uh, power. That's those who funded the nation of Israel becoming a nation again, along with the good seed. The good and bad seed. The Balfour Agreement. 
They agreed together to make Israel a nation again. And in 1948, it became a nation. So there you have his seed, the Kenites, her seed, the, the good seed, the good fig, the bad fig being the Kenites, and it, in other words, the nation. When you see Israel become a nation again and put forth leaves, in other words, not putting forth any fruit because they don't believe in Jesus Christ and they hold to the Babylonian Talmud as well as the old law and reject the New Testament and the gospel of Christ and Christ, you know that summer is nice. So when you see that event happen, it would be the generation living at that time. Okay, There are people that say, well, a generation is 40, 70, or 120 years. Well, it didn't say that it would be the generation that was born when Israel became a nation. It said the generation that would be. That generation shall not pass until all things be fulfilled. Verse 33. So likewise you, or ye, when ye shall see all things, or excuse me, when you shall see all these things. In other words, when, when you see the abomination of desolation, when you see Israel become a nation, when you see all that has been being discussed, know that it is near even at the door. In other words, Christ's return is imminent. Verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now that doesn't mean, again, the generation that was born on May uh, 15th of 1948. It means the generation that was alive that saw it come to pass. And they are all very old now. Verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, what was happening in the days of Noah? Well, the fallen angels were here. People were giving and taking in marriage. The fallen angels were giving man um, knowledge and wisdom that he shouldn't have possessed. In other words, they were lying. They were corrupting man. And they were giving and taking in marriage. In other words, in this case, they're taking the bride of Christ. And what happened because of that? God built an ark for Noah. He didn't rapture him away. God showed Noah how to build this ark, I should have said. okay, But still, God gave him the unction to do it. And there was a great flood on the earth. Now, we read of a great flood coming in Revelation chapter uh, 12 and, and 13. I believe it's 13, actually. But no, it was. It was Revelation chapter 12. There's a great flood coming. Only it's a flood of lies. It's not a literal flood. It's not like you see in these end-of-the-world movies that are full of crap and all the global warming nonsense where they tell you the ice caps are going to melt and the entire world's going to be underwater. It's not what the flood is. It's going to be a flood of lies. Verse 38, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. That is to say, they were having good old times and getting drunken, marrying and giving in marriage. They were mixing with the fallen angels until the day that Noah, that's the Greek for Noah, entered into the ark. Verse 39, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. See, people try to use this verse again to imply rapture. They didn't know that the flood was coming because they don't understand. Those of old didn't know the flood was coming, and when they were told of it, they didn't believe. Those of this time are being warned about a flood that is coming, only it'll be a flood of lies, and they don't believe either. They hold to that rock in the middle of the river, the false rock of the rapture. The easy way out, the, the path of least resistance. We don't have to worry about nothing. All we got to do is believe. We don't have to study the Bible. All we got to do is attend church and put money in the coffer and sing a hymn. 
and then we're free for the rest of the day. <clears throat> now also, let us not lose uh, in this that the flood of Noah was on the earth for 150 days. You know what 150 days is? That is a perfect Hebrew five months. How long is the tribulation of the Antichrist? Five months. Revelation chapter 9. And again, Noah was not raptured. Noah obeyed God and prepared ahead of time and was saved on a piece of earth. When I say a piece of earth, I mean a tree that grew up out of the earth or a massive amount of trees that grew up out of the earth. He wasn't raptured away. He wasn't taken away. Verse 40. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Now many are going to see, you know what? I can't wait for our Lord to come and take me away because that's the easy way out. But what this means is, what did we just read? They knew not until the flood came and took them away. Two shall be in the field. In other words, working. The one's going to be taken by the deception. They're going to go running for the Antichrist when people say he's here or there. The other's going to stay in the field working. Verse 41. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Same analogy. One's going to be taken in deception, the other one's going to be left. You have to realize this is written in 1611 English and translated from it. What did taken mean in 1611? If someone said a castle is taken, or a nation, or a piece of land is taken, does it mean rapture? Taken means taken in deception. It doesn't mean take to the sky or fly up and meet the Lord in the air the way most think. If it was, Christ would not say this. Verse 42. Watch therefore. For you know in not what hour your Lord doth come. Well, let me assure you, if you were standing there watching and he came as lightning, do you think you'd be any safer from being in delusion? Not unless you know the truth. You can't prepare that way. Watch means stay on watch. Be a watchman. Study your father's word so that you know the truth about how things are going to come to pass. Okay, you better be on watch when the Antichrist comes. You better not fall asleep. Verse 43. But know this. If the good man of the house had known in what wash the thief would come, he would have watched. See, there's your clue right there. If the good man of the house, and you could even say the church or the body of Christ, had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched. Now Christ told us to watch. We know when the thief is coming. That is to say, before Christ. We know that he's coming before Christ. He, he drops down to this earth in the fifth trump. He takes power at the sixth, and Christ doesn't come to the last trump, the final trump, the seventh trump. He would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. In other words, made a desolation. Now, we don't know the date. We don't know the hour. Christ told us we wouldn't know that, but we will know the season. We will know when world government comes to power. We will know when the two witnesses show up. We will know, or at least soon thereafter. And we will know when Satan shows up that he is not Christ. Because we'll still be in our flesh bodies. Flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. We'll still be in the flesh when Antichrist is here. We will not leave the flesh until the true Christ comes. Verse 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. In other words, many people are going to be falling and worshiping the wrong one, and they're not going to think that the Son of Man is coming. They're going to think he's already here. So they're not going to be looking for another coming of the Son of Man. That is to say, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's why they're going to be taken by surprise and that's why they're going to cry and mourn and ask for the mountains to fall upon them to save them from the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant 
whom his Lord has made ruler, ruler over his household. Not his own household, but the Lord's household. To give them, that is to say the flock of the church, meat in due season. Not milk toast, not doctrines of men, but meat. Sustenance. Verse 46. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. In other words, what? Feeding his children. Not waiting to fly away. Verse 47. Verily, or truly I say unto you, he shall make him ruler over all his goods. In other words, those that overcome are going to be given everything. They're going to be joint heirs with Christ. Verse 48. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, verse 49, and beget to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. In other words, if people that maybe even knew the truth begin to go back to being earthly and lose the truth, and eat and drink with the drunken, and you could reference Mystery Babylon and the kings that are drunken with the wine of her fornication at the end of this earth age. Um, verse 50. The Lord of that servant will come in an hour when he looketh not for him, and in an hour he is not aware of. Verse 51. And shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. People are going to cry and mourn so bad whenever the true Christ does return. Now we're going to go and we're going to discuss the abomination of desolation. We're going to go and cover some of Daniel chapter 8 and some of Daniel chapter 9. I am not going to go into the prophecy of days with regards to Daniel because there are many things in it which are very hard to understand that would detract from this study at this particular point. And I really don't feel that they're going to edify with regards to this particular Bible study. Um, there are other lectures where I have discussed this, and uh, there are many things which are still under misunderstood about the days. Again, no man can take the years of Daniel, or even the days of Daniel, or whatever, and come to a conclusion of when Christ is going to return. And if they say they can, then they're misleading themselves. We'll know the season. We'll know by the events that happened that Christ told us to watch for, but that's how we know, not by setting dates. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. Verse 2. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw, that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw a vision, and I was by the river Uli. Verse 3. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before me, or excuse me, before the river, a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher came up last. In other words, <coughs> he turned his head over. The more powerful came up next, in other words. Verse 4. And I saw a ram pushing westward and northward, and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will, and became great. Now just hang on. Verse 5. And as I was considering, behold, and he goat came from the west, on the face of the whole earth, and he touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes, Verse 6, And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river. And he ran into him in the fury of his power. Verse 7, And I saw him come close to the ram, and he was moved with choler against him, and he smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped, ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Verse 8. Therefore the he-ghost waxed great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And 
for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. That is to say the four directions. Verse 9. Verse 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn. Okay? A little horn. This also is an analogy. This is referring to Satan. In other words, Satan only needs a little power. And that's what a horn is symbolic of. But he waxed exceedingly great, which was exceedingly great, towards the south, towards the east, and towards the pleasant land. In other words, that means he came out of the north towards the pleasant land. He came out of the side that you would expect God to see. And the pleasant land, of course, being uh, not only Judah, the, the uh, uh, Israel, but naturally Jerusalem, where headquarters of Babylon will be. Verse 10. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. In other words, do you remember that Satan's tail drew one-third of the stars of heaven and caused them to be cast to the ground? And he stamped on them. Now, why on earth would Satan stamp upon his own? Because he doesn't care about them any more than he cares about the rest. He's all about himself. His job is to kill as many of God's children as possible. And he's already got him roughly 7,000 and many more that probably are going to be judged to hell as hell is increasing her border. Verse 11. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Who's the prince of the host of heaven? It's Christ. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. And the place of the sanctuary was cast down. Now, there's a twofold meaning in this. It was through Satan and the Kenites that the daily sacrifice was taken away. That is to say, uh, that Christ was uh, sacrificed for one and all times and people quit worshipping him. In other words, what is our sacrifice supposed to be to God? It's supposed to be our unrequited love, our loyalty. We are to love the Lord God, e even as Christ, with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. And the place of the sanctuary was cast out. Where's the sanctuary at? Well, that would be Jerusalem. In other words, that's God's favorite place upon the earth. It's going to be made a desolation. So we can tell who it is because he magnified him even to the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away. Verse 12. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. That is to say, sin. And it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Okay, do you understand that, what that means? And host was given him. Okay, a host of what? A host of angels, fallen angels, his locust army, against the daily sacrifice. In other words, and even people are going to be following them. By reason of the transgression. What is the transgression? The abomination of desolation being spoken of here. And it cast down the truth to the ground. Okay, so what happens when truth is cast down? Lies prosper. And it practiced and prospered. Now, we're going to leave here for a minute and we're going to go to Daniel chapter 9. And we're going to begin in verse 21. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 21. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man, okay, here's another uh, example of where a man, Gabriel, which means man of God, uh, is called a man and not an angel. Yea, while I was in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swifty, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. That is to say, the, the evening offering. Verse 22. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Verse 23. At the beginning of thy supplication, that is to say, your prayers, 
the commandment came forth. And I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter, and consider the vision. Verse 24. Now naturally this has relevance to the 70 weeks of Daniel, in which the 69th week, the false Christ comes, and his week is a week of days. Cut in half as the buildup of the world system comes into place, the first three and a half years, and then the second half shortened to a five-month period, Revelation chapter 9. But this also has to do with seven years that were determined against the people of Israel in which they would be carried away to Babylon. So there is a historical type here and a prophetical type. I choose to teach from the prophetical. Verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, that is to say Israel, and upon the holy city, that is to say Jerusalem, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. Okay? Now, we know that as long as man in the flesh, he's going to sin. This is to make an end of sins. That's why we can read this as prophetical. And to make reconciliation for iniquity, that is through the blood of Christ, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. In other words, to seal up the vision and prophecy for what? For many days. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks. Okay, that's 69 weeks. And the streets shall be built again, even the wall, even in troublesome times. Now, uh, that did happen historically. And believe it or not, it's happening now in Jerusalem because they're evicting people off the land and they're building a new temple. And it is troublesome times because look at all the rockets that have been fired back and forth between Israel and the nations as Israel stands there and plays the victim card. Verse 26, And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And naturally we're talking about Satan, the prince of Tyrus. We're talking about Satan, the prince that stands up in the place of the prince of princes. And they're going to come and destroy the city. That is to say, they're going to make a desolation out of Jerusalem and the sanctuary, God's holy place. Naturally, this did happen historically as well. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. Now, what flood do you suppose we're talking about? Revelation chapter 12? Where the uh, devil, the dragon, cast out a flood after the remnant of the woman's seed because he's wroth with her? We are talking about Israel after all. And the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of war and desolations are determined. In other words, until the very end, to the end of all wars and to the end of all desolations, until the return of the true Christ. Verse 27. And he, he who, the, the false one, the false Messiah, the spurious Messiah, the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's a week of days. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. In other words, the things recorded that shall come upon all those that are desolate. This is the abomination of desolation. And it was to take place over a week of days. That is to say, in our time, looking back at Daniel, a seven year period. And I still believe that the three and a half years of one world system, global government buildup, will take place. And then the next five months after that will be his time to show up as the Antichrist himself. The first beast transitioning to the second beast. But what else do we see here that happened at midweek in the past? Well, it was on a Wednesday that our Lord and Savior 
the sacrifice for one and all times, was crucified. And that caused the daily oblation to cease. Because Christ became that oblation. Christ became that lamb slain. That perfect offering for one and all times. And Satan wishes to do away with Christ's work. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. In other words, he, he does make Christ desolate. Now, does he really make Christ desolate? Or does he make the people desolate that believe upon him? Well, the answer is simple. He deceives the world, not Christ. Even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And you can consider this the vows of the book of Revelation, which are poured out upon the people. In other words, God is not happy. Now, let us go back to Daniel chapter 8. <clears throat> We're going to pick it up in verse 23. This is to let you know what's going to happen. And this is a, a, a basic... Uh, you know what? Daniel and the book of Revelation are overlays of one another. And in reading this, you should see very much what you see in the book of Revelation. And if you're studied of our Father's Word well enough, you will. And if you don't, get cracking and start studying. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom, in other words, in the latter days, when the transgressors, that is to say the Kenite global government and all that follow it through communism and socialism and uh, not only that, but Satan coming as Antichrist, uh, pre-coming pre, pre as Antichrist, I should say, right before his coming, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king, now I want you to notice there's a lowercase k on this king, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Verse 24. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. You know, it was God that created him and made him the full pattern. And he shall destroy wonderfully. In other words, he's not coming with war and pestilence and famine. He's going to come as gentle as a lamb, claiming to be the Mashiach, the Messiah returned unto his people. He will claim, no doubt, to be Muhammad. He will claim, no doubt, to be David. He may even claim to be other gods of other nations, saying, yes, I was all of them, and now I have come for all of you. And the world's going to fall for it. He's going to destroy wonderfully. He's going to destroy with good works, the same way the Kenites do. You know, they clothe themselves in good works. And shall prosper, and shall practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Now, who are the mighty and holy people? Christianity. Christendom. They're going to be deceived by him. Verse 25. And through his policy, also he shall cause craft to prosper at his hand. In other words, he's going to have power to do all kinds of miracles and to set policy. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. Uh-oh, that, that should tell you who it is. And by peace, understand this, by peace, he claims to be the Prince of Peace. He claims to be Jesus, shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the Prince, capital P, of Princes, lowercase p. But he shall be broken without hand. In other words, God's Holy Spirit's going to take care of him, and God's going to destroy him from within at his appropriate time. He's going to stand up and magnify himself against the Prince of Princes, which is Christ. Verse 26, And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. In other words, Daniel certifying that what he saw is real. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, wherefore it shall be for many days. That is to say, I should have said Gabriel certifying that this is true. Daniel also, because Daniel wrote it. Verse 27, And I, Daniel, faded, and was six certain days afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. In other words, he went back to serving Nebuchadnezzar. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. In other words, he didn't have a clue what it meant. Now, 
We're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the rapture chapter. So enjoy this, won't you? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, a letter of Paul. Very misunderstood chapter. We're going to understand it. We're going to see how it's mistakenly taken out of context. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as if you re have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. In other words, as you have learned how to please God, that is to say through the worship of Christ and, and good works and study and passing on the word, that you abound more and more. In other words, that you will grow. Verse 2. For ye know the commandment we, we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Or you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Okay, naturally, fornication of the flesh is a terrible thing. But fornication with Satan is even worse. And that's what the subject here is. Because you don't want to be in bed with the wrong husband. You don't want to become impregnated by the wrong husband. Hence what we read earlier about woe to those that give suck and that uh, are with child. Verse 4. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That is to say, your body. Verse 5. Not the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Okay, now, why are Gentiles brought into this? Because they don't know the ways of God. And if you don't know the word of God, then yes, you're going to have lust not only of the flesh, which is bad enough, but you're also going to lust for the easy way out. You're going to lust for the coming of Christ because things are so bad here upon the earth that when the false one shows up, you're going to hop on his taxi and take a ride. Only you ain't going nowhere. Verse 6. But that no man might be go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such. In other words, everyone who does that, God's going to get you for it. And we also have forewarned you and testified. Verse 7. For God hath not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. Verse 8. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. In other words, he that despiseth, and that, that can mean humanity, or your brother, or family members, or other human beings. I mean, look at Antifa. Yeah, look at Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, claiming that, that they just want equality. Well, that's not what it's about. Look at all the churches that are taking in money, you know. Hand over fist taking in money. You think they really care about their flock? They care about their wallets. He that therefore despises, despises not man, but God. In other words, if you're doing it to them, you're doing it to God. All sin is against our Father who hath also given unto us the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Comforter. Verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write to, unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. In other words, it's, it's in man's nature. But it's also in God's word. Verse 10. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren, which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. In other words, spread brotherly love more and more. Tell them the truth. Publish the gospel amongst all nations. Verse 11. And that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to your work with your own hands as we command you. In other words, that you study, that you learn to be quiet, that is to say not shoot your mouth off, It also means to be at peace and to do your own business. In other words, keep your nose out of other people's business and to work with your own hands. In other words, 
not only your godly works, but the work that you do. In other words, make your own living, make your way, as we commanded you. That's what Paul did. Verse 12. That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing, and that ye may walk, walk honestly towards them that are without. Well, you can consider this without the word of God. In other words, be an example of honesty to them. Be a good example. Show them what the power of a Christian is. And that you may have lack of nothing. Verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That ye sorrow not, even as others that have no hope. The word asleep here is G7387. And it is koimayo. From G2749, it means to put to sleep. In example, passively or reflectively, to slumber. Figuratively, to decease. To fall. To be asleep, to be dead. Okay, so what is Paul telling us here? He's saying, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. Concerning them which have passed on. In other words, you're fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that have passed on, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. In other words, people who don't believe in God. Even as the Gentiles were ignorant of the truth of God. Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. In other words, even those that are in Christ will Christ bring with him when he comes. Now Christ resurrected in the flesh but we do not resurrect in the flesh. Why? Because ashes to ashes, dust to dust. What goes or comes from the ground goes back to the ground. We don't need these flesh bodies anymore. They're nasty, they're filthy, they're painful, they, they grow old. We don't need them anymore. All the people that have died in Christ which sleep in Christ, that is to say, will God bring with him? When? At his return. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that is to say, by what's written in the word of God, that we which are alive and remain, that is to say, we'll let it go here, unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Why can't we prevent them which are asleep? They're already with God. We can't precede them. We can't prevent them. Why? They're dead. They died in Christ. They died uh, and, and will be judged. But if they overcame in the blood of the Lamb, they're with Christ. We, we can't even see their spiritual bodies. Okay, So we sure can't prevent them. Now they might be able to see us, but we can't see them. That is to say, they can look in on us. Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. That is the seventh trump. The farthest one out. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Why? Because they're already with him. They've already risen. Now why does it say shall rise first? Well, this is a transliterical error. I mean... They have already risen. When we die, we go back to the Father which gave us. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. But they overcame first. We're going to overcome when Christ returns. Verse 17. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Now this, right there, that is rapture 101 for most people. Okay? We which are alive and remain, in other words, to the, the coming of Christ, that, that, that means that we've got to go through the tribulation, by the way, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now most people see clouds and air here and they think, atmosphere, troposphere, stratosphere. 
cumulus clouds, cumulonimbus, cirrus cloud. But we're going to go into this in just a minute. Let's go ahead and read verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. In other words, it is a comfort that we're going to be uh, caught up with Christ. But caught up, what does that mean? Does that mean raptured? Uh, not a bit of it, buddy. First of all, let's check out the word clouds here. The Strong's Concordance. The word clouds as used here is 3507. Nephile. From 3509. Properly cloudiness, i.e. concretely a cloud. Okay? Now, if you just use the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, you're going to completely miss what the, uh, the meaning behind this is. It says the thickness of a cloud, and we will go into that in a more, uh, more in a minute. Now, G3509 is cloud nephos, apparently from a primary word, a cloud. Cloud metaphor. Why is it a metaphor? Well, we're going to go and read one verse from Hebrews chapter 12 right here. This is the same man speaking in Hebrews chapter 12 as is speaking right here in uh, 1 Thessalonians. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1, the words of this same author Paul. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race which is set before us. In other words, you don't end the race till the race is over. Now, the word used here, cloud, as in a cloud of witnesses, is the same word. It is 3509, Nephos, of 3507. So, when we're caught up into the clouds, into the air, we're going to go into air in a minute. We're caught up into a massive group of people, which the Lord is bringing with him. But not to leave this earth. Christ is coming to this earth. It is written, the kingdoms of this earth are become the kingdoms of God and his Christ. In other words, God is coming up here to set up kingdom. We're not going there. Now let's check out the word air. It is Greek word 109 in your Strong's Concordance. It is ar, or air, from the word aimi, and it means to breathe unconsciously. An example, to respire, that is to say respiratory. By analogy, to blow. Can you blow on your hand? <sighs> do you see anything when you do that? No, but you know there's air there, don't you? And then it says air as naturally circa ambient. Do you know what happens when you breathe in air and blow out carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide? That's natural circa ambience. It's also natural circa ambience when the air on the earth flows around in the latitudes. But if you go and compare this with the blue letter lexicon, Strong's Concordance, the blue letter le Bible, the definition there is the lower and denser air of the earth. And it says breathable, as in breath. As in the breath of life that God breathed into Adam and the man became a living soul. In other words, we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the breath of life in our spiritual body. And we're going to be amongst a great cloud of witnesses that are with him. Not Satan's locust army, but Christ's heavenly body of Christians. And those that he freed from the pit. Now, we're going to clarify this. We're going to go one more place. And then we're going to end this Bible study for today. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, same author. Paul wrote this second letter to the Thessalonians to clear this mess up. And it was cleared up until about 1830 when a lady named Mary Margaret MacDonald began uh, 
channeling a spirit, a demonic spirit, a familiar spirit, and claimed that there was going to be a rapture. And two clergy that sat by took it and ran with it. And they went out amongst the world, two witnesses, two false witnesses, and began this whole rapture doctrine that didn't exist before, except in misunderstanding. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. You need to pay strict attention to this. This is going to be one of the keys of David that unlocks many things for you. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren. Okay, Paul says, I want to beseech you. I want to speak very seriously and vehemently to you, brethren. By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. That's the subject. In other words, Paul is saying, I want to talk to you very seriously about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Verse 2. That you be not soon shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor as by letter, as from us. In other words, his first letter where he talked about meeting the Lord in the clouds and in the air. As the day of, of Christ is at hand. In other words, he wants you to be ready for that day. He doesn't want you to be shaken in mind, which means confused. He doesn't want you to be troubled by anyone, the man of sin or any false teacher, nor by a spirit, that is to say, false spirit pretending to be the Holy Spirit, nor by word, that is to say, the word of man or the, even the word of God that you misunderstand, nor by his first letter, the letter that we just got through reading. Verse 3, let no man, again, as, same as Christ said, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The day of our gathering back to Christ, the day of the Lord, shall not come except their coming falling away first. Okay, can you guess what that falling away might be? Revelation chapter 9. Satan coming down here claiming to be Christ. The word falling away here is apostasia. It is G646, and it is a feminine of the same as G647. It means defection from truth. Properly, the state of defection from the truth. Apostasy. Falling away to forsake. In other words, to forsake the truth. And it is where the word apostate comes from. And quite frankly, it is also a root word of Apollia. Apollia is one of the names of Satan. You may recall we read Apollyon and Abaddon. Well, Apollia is G684, a derivative of G622, ruin or loss, physical, spiritual, or eternal, damnable nation, Destruction, die, perdition, perish, pernicious ways, and waste. Now, why is that going to be important to us? Well, as we read on, what as we read on in this particular verse, let no man deceive you by any means. In other words, don't fall for it, even if you do see miracles. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, apostasy. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Okay, we already learned from Ezekiel 28 how he became the son of perdition. We've seen from Isaiah 14 what he's done. He's called the son of perdition, which means the son who is to perish, the son who is to die, the only son of God named by name who has been condemned to die in hell. Now, others have been damned, and they will go to hell, but Satan is the only one named to go. And again, what is an apostate? You know, we'll go to the uh, Webster's Dictionary for this one. It's a noun. It is a person who renounces a religious or political brief or principle. Okay? A person who renounces a religious or a political belief or principle. It's also an adjective, which is a word of action. It means to abandon a religious 
or a political belief or principle. Being deceived out of one's faith applies here. If one is deceived into worshiping the false Christ in place of the real Christ because they're not learned of our Father's word, then they're going to lose their way and they're going to be deceived. And this is why the tribes of the earth mourn when the true Christ shows up after they've been worshiping what they thought was Christ. So let's read verse 3 again. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of the Lord, that is to say, shall not come except there come a falling away first. That is to say, the abomination of desolation, an apostasy. And that man of sin be revealed. In other words, Satan revealed to be the Antichrist. As the son of perdition, the son who is to perish. Verse 4 who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Again, do we need to go back and cover Ezekiel 28 or Isaiah 14? Verse 5, Remember ye not, when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Verse 6, and now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. In other words, Paul is telling you, now you know what we're waiting for. We're waiting for Satan to be revealed as the Antichrist. By the coming of the true Christ. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. Now, who is it that lets Satan? Who is it that has hold on Satan? It's Michael. And when Michael's taken out of the way, Satan is cast to the earth, as we read in Revelation chapter 9. And he releases his locust army, and woe to the world when that happens. Verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord... Now, don't miss this. This is your key. And then shall that wicked be revealed. In other words, Satan going to be revealed for being what he was. The abomination of desolation, the Antichrist. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. That is to say, Revelation 1.16, the Holy Spirit. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, do you get that? Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. In other words, why, does, why is his work after the work of Satan? Well, because he is Satan. But he doesn't claim to be Satan. He claims to be Christ. And he does it with all powers and signs and lying wonders. Remember Revelation 13. He has power to do miracles and to bring lightning down upon the earth. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Verse 11. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. What lie do you suppose they're going to believe? Well, they're going to think Satan is Jesus. They're going to think Satanus is Yeshua. Verse 12, that they might all be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, they had pleasure in their earthly wealth. They had pleasure in the things that they did upon the earth instead of studying our Father's word. Or they had pleasure in deceiving the world, the Kenites. Verse 13, but we are bound to give thanks always for to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and the belief of the truth. Verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the, Lord, of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15. Therefore, brethren, be stand fast. Or excuse me. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. That is, same thing as be, be steadfast. And hold to the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Verse 16. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consola, consola, consolation, 
I'm getting tired, as you can probably tell. And good hope through grace, verse 17, comforts your hearts and establish you in every good work. Now, this is where I'm going to end this Bible study for today. When we come back in the next study, we're going to be going to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to learn the difference between the two bodies, the spiritual and the earthly, the celestial and the terrestrial, and we're also going to learn where are the dead. We already know that they're with Christ. You read Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, you are to know that they gather back to our Father which gave us. But we're going to be covering that. Meanwhile, brothers and sisters in Christ, Stay in our Father's Word every day, if you can, certainly every week. Study to show yourself approved. Use the tools afforded to us, the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, the J.P. Green's Interlinear, the Smith's Bible Dictionary, the E.W. Bullinger Companion Bible, the Septuagint, the Maserati Text, whatever you can use. First and foremost, pray to our Father for guidance and wisdom when you study our Father's Word. And brothers and sisters, always remember to do, pray for those that walk in darkness, because God knows now in this earth age, they are the ones that need it the most. Until we see you again, may God bless you and thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.